Hello and welcome to another end of the week edition of Fat Tell Daily. Today, as always, I'm joined, as always on a Friday, I'm joined by Nick Hubble. How are you doing, mate? Yeah, good. I feel like this is a special position to be the last one each week. Yeah, save the best till last every single week, except when you want to swap days. Uh, how's it going in Japan? I believe they have just chosen a monetary hardliner. That's what you say in your speech today. Speech, sorry, in your in your piece today. And it caused stocks to crash 4%. Um, whereas here in Australia, as you also say, they're, st- they're still not tempted to cut rates. So the cost of living is still pretty, pretty uh, biting here. Uh, but it's not for a certain group of people. So do you want to just give us a little summary in your own words of what your Fat Tail Daily edition is all about? Yeah, here in Japan, they've had like a tiny bit of inflation, but because they're so used to deflation over such a long period of time, it came as a big shock. So everyone was extremely upset about it. Uh, they were all complaining that it was like the 1980s. Um, they call it a bubble in English. Um, mm. They use the English word. And now that their latest prime minister is um, sort of anti-inflation, like pro high interest rates, and this, this sunk the stock market like over several days now. And the interesting thing about this is that it exposes that the boom in the Japanese stock market of the last few years was at least to a great extent fueled by this loose monetary policy that was perceived to be coming down the line. So it's um, machinations of the of the political and central bank world rather than real stock market gains, um, Mm. which is important because that spread to Japan now. It's been the the norm in so many places. Um, But the article today is is about the idea that. Even though inflation has returned to the target level in lots of different countries, it's a long list now, or at least it's very close in in some of them. Um, People still feel like prices are incredibly high. Uh, I think there was a presentation by a journalist in the UK, maybe from the BBC, who pointed out that, you know, prices have have skyrocketed. But the inflation measure that everyone's talking about is just that little bit at the top, right? So it's very misleading to say, well, inflation's back to normal. Therefore, you know, we can declare we've won the war on inflation when prices are still up double digits big time in the uk but also in australia and in australia we have this added feature that the central bank is not yet cutting interest rates despite the fact that inflation has come back down towards the target which means the cost of living for those who borrowed money is even higher um so there's a bit of a bizarre story here to the idea that we try and manage inflation by making the cost of living even more expensive for borrowers um seems a bit unfair to sort of throw the the burden of inflation onto just one sector of the economy um yeah. but that's the way we seem to do it and my point in the article is that there is another sector that has actually been comp- not just immune to inflation over the last few years but has actually had their price their cost of living fall uh, quite radically in some cases um and that's what i try and get people to do for themselves in the future so that if inflation does come back as i expect it will eventually um they will be in that same position yeah, well, that 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 um, the, the the solution, as you say, is of course won't be a surprise. Probably gold. Um, now you mentioned that the gold standard is sort of no better than a p- political promise, too, right? H- how do you see the role of gold evolving in our current financial system, given the increasing interest in things like you know crypto and other alternative mm-hmm. stores of value? Yeah, people like me usually sort of say you know, everything was perfect under the gold standard. All we need to do is go back to the gold standard and, and inflation will be a, a tale of the past. The problem with that is that a gold standard is just a political promise. And I go through in the yeah. article some examples of how the, you know, that's true and political promises are broken. So if you're putting your faith in the gold standard, you're really putting your faith in a political promise that will eventually be broken. So that's not really the best way to go, I don't think. The better way to go is for yourself to go on your own personal gold standard, which means keeping a lot of your wealth um, in gold so that if when inflation you know, comes by and the gold price rises as a result, you will have you know, succeeded in, in um, preserving your purchasing power, at least over the very long term, um, and you'll be able to escape those consequences. That has worked especially well over the last few years, um, barring a, a short period where the US dollar gold price didn't move fast. But nevertheless, over the last four years, over the last two years, over the last 20 years, um, most, most periods you can go back by. Gold's outperformed inflation. In some cases, it's, it's outperformed stocks even. But I, I think at the moment, the reason the gold price is going up so much 
is that because central bankers are starting to realize this as well, especially central bankers outside of the West. Mm -hmm. So as soon as the Americans and the Europeans sanctioned the Russian central bank over the war in Ukraine, all these central bankers around the world realized that if they hold their reserves in US dollars and in US dollar assets, such as government bonds, then they can be subject to these sorts of sanctions. And they want to have more freedom. They don't want to be under the thumb of the American government to that extent and the European governments. And so they started diversifying, or as, as analysts like to say, recycling their reserves mm. into gold because gold is not subject to these same sanctions and pressures. Uh, and so they've sort of inadvertently gone back to this you know, ancient gold standard indirectly through the back door. Um, and it's become a key part of their reserves. And it could emerge to become uh, one of the global trading currencies as well if the Americans continue to sort of tighten the screws on, um, on countries like Russia and, and other places. Um, countries might actually start doing deals, um, trade deals, using gold or some derivative of gold or something that's tied to gold. So yeah. the link these days to gold in the global monetary system is less direct, but it's still very much there. Um, and it's still playing that, that crucial role of the ultimate reserve asset. And actually, recently, it's become openly acknowledged that this is the case, even from central banks. There was recently a comment from the Dutch central bank uh, to this effect that gold preserves purchasing power and has this you know, geopolitical risk hedge and all these other features, things that you and I used to write about 10 years ago that no central banker in their right mind would openly admit to is now become uh, sort of the normal thing for them to say, to try and explain and excuse why they've been suddenly buying gold. And I think that's one of the catalysts behind the, the gold price rally over the last um, two years now, but also going back longer than that. Yeah, I'm actually reading a book at the moment. Um, it's quite a huge, that that thick. I'm, when I say reading it, I'm listening to it on um, uh, on Audible just because it's easy. I've got kids working full time and, you know, it's just easier to do that. I go for some early morning walks and, and it's the, the rise and fall of the Third Reich. And uh, the, the preceding thing that happened to that is you're right. That was the last time before that war and before World War I was the last time the world was on a true gold standard. But you're right. The only way that Britain and the European powers paid for the wars was by sev severing that tie and just printing. So I think, yeah, you're right. Debasement is just... It's, it's, it's how governments break promises all the time, isn't it? Um, and the yeah. people Woody, that... Woody, can you, can you think of any sort of grand cause that might cost, you know, an absurd amount of money that's very much worth printing huge amounts of money for that's, that's sort of coming down the line in the, in the next 26 years that might cause yeah. central banks and governments to, again, print lots of money to pay for? I can. So uh, the, the reference is, of course, to Net Zero, which we've both been writing lots about, um, and our colleague Greg as well. So um, the idea here is that um, governments have taken on this impossibly expensive um, mm. challenge, and very much like a war, it's going to require an extreme level of government spending. Well, and, it's going to require war, war financing. Um, yeah. yeah, but back, back, to, back to gold's long-term sort of stability in purchasing power, um, like in, in, in light of recent technological advancements and things like that and economic shifts, do you, do you think this is a trend that's going to continue or are, are there other factors that could disrupt gold's traditional role that people kind of do fly to? It's weird, it's weird isn't it? They're, you've got some powers that go to gold to get out of a crisis and then other times when gold's at the centre of things, they use a crisis to get out of it. Yeah, there's, um, I mean, you've got about 3,000 years of history if you're going to claim that, um, that gold is going to lose this, this role that it's been playing. About 3,000 years of history to argue against um, because the gold price, well, I should say the value of gold relative to everyday things has remained pretty much stable um, over that time period. And there's many measures in between, um, you know, comparing the real value of things that more or less haven't changed a loaf of bread, a horse, an outfit from an Italian tailor, whatever it might be that haven't changed for thousands of years in some cases. Um, so if you're going to say to me, look, that, so there's technological change that's going to create an imbalance between gold's role as preserving purchasing power, uh, you'd, have, you'd have to convince me. Um, but the response would be that the same sorts of technological changes is, is occurring in the gold mining business and the gold refining business, right? So it should sort of be a, quite a, a fair balance between the two. Um, there's also the issue that 
in many periods of history, the government has been involved in the gold market by making it money, which means the price has been kind of manipulatable. Um, you know, they might have decreed price controls by decreeing the value of coinage to be a certain amount of gold or silver when it actually wasn't. Um, so yeah, right. it, it, the prices can be misleading. What we do know is that the fluctuations can be huge. So during the 70s, the gold price was first suppressed by making gold, uh, by making money of a certain amount of gold. What that triggered a speculative mania, which sent the gold price, you know, miles ahead of what inflation ever did. And then the gold price came back down. So we did have that large distortion at that point. And gold didn't purchase, preserve your purchasing power if you bought in the peak during the 70s. Mm -hmm. I think it's the late 70s. But it, and it did more than preserve your purchasing power if you bought at the bottom. So there's a couple of things you could say about that, such as buy a small amount regularly, which is probably what people should be doing anyway, because that's how you transfer your savings in. Um, or, or, you know, you can trade that. So you can say, a lot of people do this with the stock market. You can say, you know, on average, one ounce of gold buys this much of a given thing, this much, you know, 300 loaves of bread, a horse, an Italian suit, whatever it might be. When the price of, of things is, is much higher, then you can trade gold as it goes up and down and fluctuates around that that valuation. Yeah. You can do that for the stock market too. You can value the Dow Jones index in terms of gold and when it's peaking and, and troughing, you can decide to transition from gold into stocks or from stocks into gold. My father-in-law actually did that here in Japan. He noticed that the well, gold price Well, that's what Bill and Dan Denning do, our previous yeah. you know, friends and mentors and colleagues. and they, That's how they exactly. judge so, whether, yeah. whether stocks are That's the or. justification. That's the justification for those ratios. It's the idea that over the long, long term, um, the gold, gold price preserves its purchasing power. Therefore, you must be able to trade the reversion to the mean or the oscillation above and below uh, the mean. And that's one of the best long-term investment strategies for sure. And that's led them to make some very successful trades in gold uh, over the long time. Uh, you, you briefly discussed towards the end uh, uh, the CEO of a company called Tally Money. And they allow, um, you know, as an example, like a gold-based sort of like a gold-based banking system, right? Where where, um, where it offers kind of like a, a normal bank account, which is backed by gold, and you can kind of use it in the real world to buy, buy and sell goods. H how do you envision such systems potentially, do you, do you see that becoming more pr prevalent as we go into the future? Like may maybe even impacting traditional banking and monetary policy, if that sort of thing becomes a bit more widespread? Or, or do you think... I don't know. Yeah, that's a tough one because it's, I, I mean, I spend a good chunk of my day because I, I live in Japan um, mm. at the moment and usually I live in Australia. I spend a lot of my day dealing with ridiculous inefficiencies in the banking system, right? And we've done videos about this and I've written lots of articles about this. So there is absolutely no sense to what banks do and the major mainstream financial system does other than inconvenience me. Um, yeah, yeah. And so I, I don't ask me... What, what on earth they might be thinking other than trying to keep keep my money as inconveniently as possible. But um, the, the point being that um, the innovators are there now. Uh, there's gold-backed crypto, there's gold-backed tally money, um, which will eventually come to Australia, I'm sure. And once these options start to pop up, things get interesting, right? Because if people can escape the inflationary system, uh, then what are governments going to do um, about you know, that, that option out there? So that there's um, there's some sort of reckoning coming either for companies like uh, Tally Money and Gold Bullion Dealers um, or for the mainstream financial system when people say, well, we, we don't want to bear the risk of having our money devalued by double digits in two or three years. So we're going to keep mm -hmm. a good chunk of our savings in some sort of gold-related uh, asset, whether it's you know gold bars in your home or whether it's Tally Money or whether it's gold-backed crypto or just buying gold somewhere. Um, but it seems to me that most people live paycheck to paycheck anyway. So you, you might as well just be holding, you know, a chunk of your assets in gold in terms of inside a, a fund or a super fund or, or whatever or in your home or whatever it might be. Mm. I think um, dealing with it on a day to day basis, like tally money allows you to do, um, unless it's very convenient and cheap, um, I think it's, it's overthinking it. You don't want all your assets in gold anyway. Right. So having just a big chunk. Uh, well, my, my, my final question actually was give, given that you obviously think that the, the only way out of any debt and crises is going to be, and it always is, it's governments will inflate, you know, inflate the problem away. Um, what is that? What does that balance look like to you? Or does it, does it you know, ha, ha, what, how does the average investor 
balance their portfolio between gold, traditional currencies, maybe other assets to protect against that scenario? Or is that something you're not, you don't, does it depend on what stage you are in life, I guess, too, right? Yeah, that's right. So we're on thin ice here, aren't we, with the uh, with the regulatory side? Because we can't give personal financial advice, so this isn't personal financial advice. Well, no, advice. I'm talking and, generally, I guess, yeah. Yeah, the point being that, you know, it depends too much on your personal situation for, mm. to, to be particularly helpful with this. I think what is happening right now is the gold is replacing bonds um, as the de-risk purchasing power saving asset in mainstream portfolios. So for as long as I can remember, the retirement plan for every given person that a financial advisor would give would be to say, we're, depending on how risk adverse you are, meaning how old, we're going to have a growing share of your portfolio in government bonds because they're safe. And over the last few years, they've proven to be very, very unsafe. Uh, and so now I think people are wondering, well, what should I have owned that you know should now obviously be part of my portfolio going forward? And I think a large chunk of people's allocation to bonds is going to transition into gold. That's exactly what's happened at central banks, which is the big hint, right? So instead of holding each other's watch treasury, what watch what they do, not what they say. It's a bit of a cliche. Well, they started saying it reason. as well, which is the amusing part. I mean, we, mm. we often, I mean, the whole point of Fat Tail Media is that we give people ideas from the edge of the bell curve, right? And our ideas keep, keep on sort of well, that's slightly a, that's a, shuffling. That's often a question we always have. It's like, geez, when, when a lot of our stuff that we've been saying for mm. years is actually happening, what do we say now? Because we're not we're not controversial for the sake of it. Yeah, and we've built uh, we've built world. this business around um, you know these ideas that are in this Fat Tail Daily article, um, and also the ideas that that people can find in this, this presentation that Ryan Dins, our colleague, is giving about a similar technique and idea that will even surpass saving your purchasing power from inflation. So. Um, that was a long time where we started to shift to, right? We, we were all sort of gold fanatics for a long time and then we looked in the, these other opportunities that Ryan looks into. Um, so we've got to figure out what's next. I guess that's our job. One, one final question then about what's next. So you, you mentioned earlier when, um, when the dollar really first severed its link to gold, and that was back in 71, obviously, but that caused a decade long bull market in the dollar price of gold and it hit a huge all-time high and as you said in this in this it went far beyond maybe what it and then it became coming i know uh Volkner, he, he tightened the screws on inflation uh, on, on interest rates brought inflation right down but that was the start of a long-term bear market in dollar and now we're we're hitting all-time highs once again where do you can it go higher will it continue or do you do you think um there could be the scenario of another bear market in dollar terms in the price of gold what, what are your views on that over the next 10 years and we'll end on that yeah you mean in us dollar terms right um so yeah just before we got on i checked on my phone where the inflation adjusted price of gold is mm. um so that gives a bit more of an accurate representation yeah. of what the price of gold is adjusted for the value of money and we're right in the middle of this range where the peak was established um uh in the 70s late 70s so th there's this oscillation that occurs and keep in mind that the data from before the 40s or is, is sort of a bit dodgy because the government set the price of gold because gold is money. Yeah. Um, so you've got to go back thousands of years. But anyway, um, so we're right in the middle of this range, which means we're right in the middle of the range. So, it, you know, if the inflation continues and things continue to get um, worse in terms of debt and, and these sorts of issues that are driving gold, central bank gold buying and so on and so forth, then the, the gold price should continue to go up. Um, but we've, we've, we're halfway through the bull market, if that is the case. What has me worried, though, is that um, we're facing lots of challenges that we haven't had before in terms of the amount of debt, but more importantly, I think, demographics. Um, so the amount of debt per person in 10, 20 years time, 30 years time, whatever you know, time frame you want to use, means that the current debt is a much bigger problem. Historically speaking, large debt loads were just how much time is it going to take for us to solve this problem by having more and more kids and a bigger and bigger economy, therefore? Um, even if we're not getting richer on a per capita basis, we'll still grow the economy, just given enough time. So as long as we stop growing the debt too fast, this becomes a self-solving problem, right? Uh, this time around, that's not going to happen. So, so we're sort of in uncharted waters with only past wrecks to guide us. And I think the only plausible way for us to deal with this much debt is an unusual amount of inflation and financial repression, which means the gold price should theoretically go even further than it did in the 70s and 80s, um, but also mm -hmm. the inflation and the cost of living crisis. 
is going to be even worse than we've ever mm. you know, ever been through in the Western world. So I, I think there's an unusually strong reason to own gold now, even if you're halfway through this bull market, uh, because the threat to your long-term purchasing power of your money is unusually high. Um, probably less so in Australia, but you know, as we learned over the last three years, you know, overseas inflation sort of does play a role here as well. I've got a load more questions about the demographic side of things, but maybe we'll do that in another discussion. For now, thanks, Nick. Much appreciate your time. Head on over to the uh, link. Well, in the description below, I've, I've provided a link to Nick's direct article. It's 100% free as always. There will obviously be a link to a sign-up page to get our daily insights every day. And let's continue this next week, Nick. Fascinating stuff. Cheers, mate. Sounds good.